when I think about what my life has become and what it is now, like what my purpose is now, you know, I, I, I need to be useful. And when I look at this Me Too environment, there's not a whole lot of dudes that are taking accountability. You know, I f***ed up bad, bad, like crash and burn type shit, hurt a lot of people. The life of a child star is often filled with torment and anguish. There are countless examples of famous children on top of the world who then end up losing it all for many reasons, some of which being abuse that they've endured. Britney Spears, Lindsay Lohan, Macaulay Culkin, these are just some examples and staples in a lot of people's childhoods, having given up their own to provide the world with their art. Very often they're pushed into the spotlight by their parents and robbed of any chance to ever feel what it's like to be normal. Some of these child stars have seemingly found their way out of the trenches after many years, heading in the direction of a brighter future. But it was a rough road, and the same can't be said for many others. What about Shia LaBeouf? Shia was on the top of the world in 2008. Now an A-list actor, he became known worldwide for his roles in films such as Transformers and Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Even Steven Spielberg called Shia the next big thing after working with him. Shia had it all, so where did it all go wrong? Well first we need to look at how everything started. On June 11th, 1986, Shia LaBeouf was born in Los Angeles. His mother Shayna was a former dancer, though she was now unable to find success with that career and soon found herself selling jewellery and fabric she designed in a destitute area of Echo Park, LA. His father, Jeffrey, a Vietnam War veteran, had taken to working as a professional clown in order to make ends meet. Shia would describe his parents as pretty weird people, but they loved me and I loved them. Unfortunately, they would eventually divorce, due in part to financial difficulties, and in others due to substance abuse and addiction to hard drugs. Suffice to say, Shia's upbringing was difficult, with him spending periods of time living with his uncle due to his family's crippling financial issues, but eventually settling to live with his mother until age 12. During this time, Shia didn't have much of a problem with the life he was living. They were poor, sure, and his mother could barely afford to provide for him, but he didn't let that get him down. After all, what would that change? He was an incredibly mature kid, and he often would perform for his family, mimicking his father as a method of lightening the mood. Even as a child at age 10, Shia's calling was obvious when he found his way to a stage performing stand-up comedy at clubs where adults would laugh and describe him as being a 50-year-old mouth on a 10-year-old kid. With this attitude and talent, it was only a matter of time before he tried to go further maybe as far as anybody could. And one day, seeing a very well-dressed boy of a similar age, Shia inquired, how could he afford such nice clothing? This is right when Shia LaBeouf discovered acting and the concept of a child actor. Being that Shia was already more motivated and persistent than most adults, but with a childlike ability to disregard reality, it wasn't long before he was pursuing this as a career, and it all started with him as a young kid writing down numbers of talent managers that he found in the yellow pages, and then hilariously calling them pretending to be his own agent. Of course, a kid this young wasn't going to fool anyone, but he didn't need to. After all, if you're on the lookout for people who are going to be stars, how could you possibly not take a chance on a kid that tried this? And that's exactly what happened. Shai was now booking commercials and small parts in television shows, but it was at age 12 when everything started to change dramatically. Shia booked for the leading role in a Disney show called Even Stevens and was now firmly on the path to a childhood star actor. Shia then moved in with his father who accompanied him on set as his guardian and then offset, Shia returned the favour by attending Alcoholics Anonymous meetings to support his dad's recovery. Life was still a struggle now for him and for his parents but his career went from strength to strength, finally exploding with a role in the movie Howells, and then Constantine with Keanu Reeves. This ascendancy continued with a gig hosting Saturday Night Live, and then the blockbuster smash hit Transformers movie that generated over $700 million at the box office, followed by another smash with Indiana Jones that earned over $800 million. At this point, he was considered to be one of the hottest young talents and actors in the industry, a career built entirely from his own persistence and ability to chase that dream. But just like every other dream, it always ends too soon. Shires was no different, and he was about to wake up. 
In February 2013, he was abruptly fired from Daniel Sullivan's stage production of Orphans, which would have been Shire's Broadway debut. It was reported that disagreements arose between Shire and his on-stage co-star Alec Baldwin, as Shire was upset that Alec wasn't memorizing his lines quickly enough. Essentially, Shire felt that Alec was slowing him down, holding him back, and harming the production overall. Unfortunately, he didn't bring this up privately and in an adult manner, or what would have been professional or responsible. Instead, during the rehearsals and in Alec's face, he just shouted at him and told him exactly what he thought, which of course resulted in bad blood and a situation that needed to be resolved very quickly. Alec would then pull both Sullivan and the stage manager aside, informing them that they either needed to get rid of Shire, or Alec would just simply quit the production. It was a him or me situation. Shire of course was soon fired, and replaced by actor Ben Foster. Alec then talked about the situation in interviews, likening Shire as a Hollywood actor to a celebrity chef, as opposed to a real Broadway actor. At this point, acting was Shire's entire life, so of course he took great offence to this, and crossed a line by leaking emails that backed up his initial issue, proving, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that Alec was in fact slowing him down by not learning the lines, and not putting in the same dedication that Shire was to this performance. Despite his point being vindicated, no matter what, he handled it all poorly, and displayed that if things didn't go his way, there was going to be problems, and for Shire, his way was to strive for perfection, which means the future would likely be full of similar problems too, because nobody, not even Shire himself, could live up to that standard. I think because, I think because me and Alec had tension as men, mm -hmm. not as artists, but as men. I think in a room, that became a, a, a hard thing to deal with, you know, and, and when, you're, when you got tension as men, that's tough till July, I think. You know, it, it's cool for increments, mm -hmm. but I think to do that for a long period of time now, would have been uh... tough. Shire would go on to apologise to Alec, at least seemingly trying to bury the hatchet. An apology that was also accepted with a humble response from the veteran actor saying, I don't have an unkind word to say about you, you have my word. A rather peaceful ending to a chaotic situation, but this apology was the start of another Shire scandal, as when the apology email leaked, people discovered he had word for word plagiarised parts of the apology. As a one-off, all of this could of course be ignored. After all, almost all great actors find themselves having disagreements during rehearsals, or on set, and all celebrities make social media mistakes. However, over the next year, Shai was caught in multiple scandals involving his copying of other people's work. When I say copying, I mean shamelessly so, almost as if he wanted to be caught. Shire wrote, directed, and produced a short film by the name of HowardCantor.com. It soon became apparent that this film shared many similarities with the graphic novel Ghost World created by Dan Klaus. The film begins with a monologue which was taken word for word from that graphic novel. Shire would soon remove the film from all platforms and apologise for copying, stating, that this was not his intention, and he was simply inspired by Klaus's work. Again, a situation of his own making that seemed to stretch beyond belief, but was ultimately harmless if accompanied by a sincere apology and reverence for the source material. But in a way that seems somewhat unique to Shire, the apology simply raised more questions. A simple Google search of his words led to a 2010 post from Yahoo Answers, meaning yet again, Shire had simply copy-pasted an apology when being caught doing something wrong. At this point, it was too strange to not be some kind of joke, and since Shire rarely gave interviews or talked candidly about his life at this time, no one knew whether this was some kind of performance, perhaps a point being made, or if he was entirely unaware of the problematic and persistent behaviour he was displaying. As this was catching the public interest, People began digging into Shire's other tweets and public works, discovering that this odd behaviour stretched far beyond the current situation. Shire made it a habit to write tweets, apologies, and other responses, using almost word-for-word -word copies of other people. Not just that, but he'd also copied other authors' work with his prior release graphic novels. Shire then gave a reply that was not copy-pasted. Instead, claiming that copyright laws are too restrictive, and they don't, quote, allow for ideas to flow freely. 
You would now assume that Shy would just let the issue rest and continue with his still booming career as a Hollywood A-lister, but instead, Shire doubled down in what now appeared to be an effort to make his point about copyright into some form of performance. Shire tweeted about his next project called Daniel Boring, which, of course, was a ripoff from Daniel Clow's work titled David Boring. Not just that, but upon inspection, the description was copied again, word for word. The public immediately called Shire out, as well as a law firm representing Daniel Klaus issuing a cease and desist letter on the grounds of copyright infringement. Shire's response this time should come as no surprise, and also illustrates that he was not taking the situation seriously in any way. He tweeted, You have my apologies for offending you, for thinking I was being serious instead of accurately realising I was mocking you which again is a quote he copied from a Texas politician who said this during an anti-abortion debate. Shire also then rented a plane service to write, I am sorry Daniel Klaus across the sky of Los Angeles, as if this was all some big joke. He of course received deep criticism for this behavior, but when given the opportunity to respond in an interview, he said, we used to sit in a circle around a campfire and tell stories and share them and change them and own them together because they were ours. Now our stories are owned for profit. We buy corporate property and call it our culture, enriching others as we deplete ourselves. Further lending evidence to the theory that Shire's actions beyond being caught initially were purely performative in an effort to shine a spotlight on what he believes to be restrictive copyright laws, but instead just making it look as if he was simply spiralling out of control, a narrative that was becoming more and more popular in the public eye as well as within the industry. After this, things started to take a more serious turn, veering from the path of Twitter arguments and intellectual property theft to disorderly behaviour and arrests. The first major instance being on June 26th, 2014, where Shire was being disruptive during a Broadway play, shouting at the cast members, the audience, and at one point, one of the cast members walked through the audience singing, and Shire slapped his ass. Eventually, law enforcement arrived, escorted Shire out, and took him to the station, where he was charged with disorderly conduct, and later pled guilty in September of 2014. Clearly, these are not the actions of someone who's doing okay. Shire was struggling with something during this time, as it's impossible to even list the numerous examples of disorderly conduct in public that were circulating the internet. Though it wasn't until much later and after many more controversies, that Shire would open up about what those struggles were. Much like his father who had struggled his whole life with addiction, Shire had found himself right where almost every other child star has at one time, with one or more addiction issues. He was privately battling against the narcissism, ego, and lack of self-control that comes with growing up in a circumstance no human's brain can adequately handle, in an abusive relationship with an industry rife with exploitation and predators. What Shire needed wouldn't become available until much later on, until after he had destroyed his career and harmed anyone who got close enough to try and help him. I've never looked down on having a probation officer. I need somebody to keep me accountable. Because mm -hmm. freedom without guidelines and limitations is fucking madness. Mm -hmm. You know, if I strip you naked and throw you in the ocean, you'll be free, but you won't enjoy it. You know, I need, I need like, I need guidance. But as of right now, there were some strange years. He was still caught in public doing odd things, like when he showed up to the German premiere for the film Nymphomaniac wearing a paper bag that said, I am not famous anymore on his head, and then did the same thing at an art installation. Despite this, he booked an amazing movie and turned in a fantastic performance for Fury in 2014. Though again, stories from the set of that movie paint him as a brilliant but strange guy. After all, Shai considers himself a method actor, which means he was getting into the role as he always did. For instance, on Fury, he refused to shower for weeks at a time, knocked out one of his teeth, and got into multiple fist fights with other actors on set. Despite that, stories from behind the scenes depict close bonds formed with his co-stars and praise for Shire's abilities and work ethic from Brad Pitt himself. To many people, this would be a crowning achievement and a motivator to push forward with their craft. To Shire, this was yet more fuel to an already out-of-control ego that raged like an inferno. 
If there had ever been any chance of maturity, self-reflection or growth breaking Shire out from his self-destructive ways before a cataclysmic explosion, praise like this was sure to remove any possibility. With this movie, Shire was back in the public's good graces once again and people seemed to forget about the controversy, but they couldn't forget for long because his appearance in Sia's music video for the popular song Elastic Heart caught plenty of criticism due to his dancing with a 12 year old in the video, which brought up accusations and disgust. None of these events though were big enough to cause Shire too much trouble, but they were adding on to the pile already created and setting the stage for things still to come. After all, Shire was still booking large movies, escaping serious consequences for his actions, and of course still reliant on certain substances in his personal life. You know, do you change? Mm -hmm. And I didn't. You know, I, I would always like, I always had an inch left. I always had some fucking wiggle room. Mm -hmm. Every time I would fuck up, there was always some wiggle, there was always a Brad Pitt on the phone. Straight up. There was always some like, you know, Sundance some award. Next project. There was always next Alma, there was always another, there was always wiggle room to get back into ego. Mm -hmm. The next event cannot possibly be ignored. This is where Shia found himself in a place no one on the planet would ever want to find themselves, and that is on the receiving end of 4chan's attention. In 2016, after Donald Trump won the election, Shia created an art exhibit which he called He Will Not Divide Us. Shia then set up a camera on the outside wall of the New York City Museum of the Moving Image. He encouraged people to stand in front of the camera and say whatever they wanted to. Clearly this was an attempt to bring people closer together to give people an opportunity to speak their feelings. But unfortunately, the things people were speaking were not what Shire wanted to hear. If you've been around the internet for long enough, you know exactly what was gonna happen. 4chan found Shire's political statement to be a perfect venue and opportunity and started to show up shouting anything from racism to obscenities to inside jokes and of course memes. Shire reacted in an understandable, albeit incorrect manner. In hindsight, and on evidence of other situations where 4chan made someone a target, the better course of action would have been to play dead until they got bored and moved on to whatever would give them the entertainment and reaction they were looking for. Instead, Shire became a perfect target for continued harassment, essentially turning the entire situation into a game, one that he was never going to win. At one point, a man reportedly defended Hitler in front of the camera, and Shire, being a Jewish man, became enraged, shoving him repeatedly, and then being arrested, charged with misdemeanor assault and harassment, though these criminal charges were later dropped. Despite this, Shire was determined not to let these people win. 4chan was of course equally or more determined. This spawned an entire saga that is too long to recount in this video, but suffice to say, it's a legendary internet story that you should check out in one of the many videos dedicated to retelling the whole story. Essentially, 4chan found the flag, no matter where it was located, and each time, Shire moved it to a more restricted or more remote location, making it more difficult. Thousands of users were poring over every single pixel of the stream, including shadows and wind patterns, star alignments, and every single social media post from Shire, forensically studying the photos for any clues, no matter how small. It was to the point where they were hearing sounds of airplanes and checking where planes could be at that time. They could hear frogs croaking. What type of frogs would make that noise? This was the most elaborate and interesting game of capture the flag ever. Each time the flag was found, it was replaced with a Make America Great Again hat, a direct attack on Shire's political message. Eventually, Shire realized, of course, there was no way he could win against 4chan and simply quit. The livestream went down, this time forever. And while this does sound like a hilarious event, which it is, this event likely played a massive factor in the continued collapse of Shire's life. What you have to remember is that this time, according to his future self, Shire had very little in his life besides his craft and his massive ego. That innocent dude who came into the industry with all this wild, wide-eyed wonderment, Wonder, yeah. that disappeared pretty quick. I remember calling my manager and saying like, what do you mean? I'm God. Mm. You know, this is really where I was at because mm. I thought my craft was was God. I thought love, art, and God all meant the same thing to me. After the 4chan saga, Shire was arrested repeatedly for seemingly mundane and silly reasons which he shouldn't have been in in the first place, such as in a bowling alley where he was refused service of french fries and of course being drunk and disorderly in Georgia. From his behaviour, it's clear his struggles were not getting any better. 
though the public was left to simply speculate as to what those struggles could be. He apologised again on Twitter and took a break from acting to try and put his life back together. This time, it wasn't a copy-paste of someone else's words, which at least signalled a change and perhaps a more severe and sincere sentiment. It seemed as though everything was going to work out, at least for a short time. However, for Shire, he still hadn't reached rock bottom. Not yet. He did really try to get help, ending up in a rehab centre and trying to get clean. But during that time, he didn't disconnect from the work and life that intoxicated him far more than any substance ever could. During this rehab, he wrote a script about his life, a script that detailed the abuses he suffered and the struggles he endured. This movie was then released in 2019 and painted Shire's father as a very bad person. His father did sign off on this script, but not on any of the parts that Shire added later, parts that turned his father into a villain and ended up straining their relationship tremendously. The movie released in 2019 titled Honey Boy and it was received well, as well as succeeded in its exact goal, to garner sympathy for Shire, who later admitted he took creative liberties with the script in order to manipulate a response. That isn't to say that Shire did not live through abuse, addiction, exploitation and severe mental health issues, because that's all true. It's just to say that his father's role in that was more passive and with less physical violence as depicted in the movie. And I turned the knob up on certain shit that wasn't real. My dad never hit me. Never. He spanked me once, one time. And the story that gets painted in Honey Boy is like this dude was like abusing his kid all the time. You know, my dad tried to keep me from smoking cigarettes. That's when he spanked me. But that wasn't my narrative because it didn't position me as like this wounded, fractured child that you could root for, which is what I was using him for. With Honey Boy though, it was clear that Shire was still capable of acting at high level and had the drive to do so, though he was also likely considered to be a toxic asset in the industry. He was difficult to work with, and he was constantly involved in controversy. And with Shire's next project, that was about to be completely reinforced and vindicated, since in 2020, he was kicked off an entire production due to being reportedly combative and making other cast members uncomfortable. He was also then arrested again, this time for battery and petty theft charges. Clearly, during rehab, Shire had not worked through what he needed, and the noose around his career was beginning to tighten completely. The next movie Shire worked on is probably the most Shia LaBeouf story you will ever hear. This is truly a situation that on surface level seems incredibly bizarre, but also endearing and deeply interesting. Shire worked on a movie called Tax Collector, where he played an LA gang enforcer whose job was to collect money owed to the gang. The movie was not well received at all, it wasn't good, but on set they had a real LA street gang member. Shia grew close to this gang member, so much so that he joined the street gang, claiming during interviews that he was quote, jumped in. This of course being an initiation ritual where a prospect is attacked by many or all members of the gang. After being co-signed by the gang leadership for this affiliation, Shai got the LA Harpies gang tattoos on his body, and is regularly seen throwing up the gang signs in pictures, often surrounded by other members of the set. This is an incredibly bizarre story, but one that summarizes Shia LaBeouf as a human, completely unpredictable, and clearly someone who others gravitate toward. And the most interesting part of this whole story is that Shia found in this gang a family that he was missing, and influences that would later change his life, finally in a positive way. But first, Shire needed to reach the end of his journey in this story of Hollywood, and finally hit rock bottom, which is exactly what happened next. Multiple allegations surfaced about Shire from ex-girlfriends, one accusing him of a number of things including emotional and physical abuse, with another discussing publicly how he used people, was manipulative and generally just a very damaged person, but clarifying he didn't abuse her in those same ways. A lawsuit was then filed against Shire, with at least two other prior partners joining up to detail what he did to them. The trial was set for late 2023, but has since been postponed until 2024. Now this is where a rise and fall video would end, because Shire's life at this point of the story is in complete shambles. He's been exposed as being a terrible person. He has no career left to speak of. Everybody hates him and thinks he's crazy. 
We could do that and of course ignore the human element of this man's life, which would be an easy pill to swallow, because if you have watched until now, he does of course deserve every bit of criticism for his actions, as well as for the people he's wronged to feel that way about him. But for once in his life, Shire appears to genuinely be remorseful for what he's done, and he admits to have done all of these things, to be all of the things people call him. He acknowledges he's treated everyone around him terribly, that he's been a monster, consumed by his own ego, his narcissism, his drive to be the absolute best, devoid of all feelings for those around him, seeing people as stepping stones simply to propel his career and his ego higher, using anything and anyone to feed whatever it was inside him that could never be satisfied, that he was performing with everybody but never truly going to change. All that mattered was getting back to the top and staying there. But after hitting rock bottom, it's now or never, and to me, it looks like he's actually on the right path. I wound up at this rehab, right, um, in Utah, and they do something called Family Week. Everybody who's involved in the program has their family show up on these Skype calls. Week one, no one shows up for me, no one. Week two, week three, I'm there 90 days, so I'm there for a, 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 a clip. There comes a point where family week comes around. I say to my therapist, like, ah, I'm, I'm not gonna go. You know, what I mean? like, I don't, I don't want to subject myself to this shit. Like, I'm, and she says, no, I think you should show up this week. And Mia is on the screen, and you know, like, Ugh. you don't deserve that kind of shit. You know what I mean? You don't deserve that kind of shit. Like, like, I don't deserve that kind of shit. You know, I done put I done put her through years and years of fucking nonsense, bro. Just like admitting your faults, recognizing what you've done is wrong, to who you've done wrong, trying to make amends. I don't know that you can do more than that as a human. After all, what are you supposed to do after you've done bad things to people and lived a life like this? If you completely condemn a person, that means there's no chance for redemption for anybody, which is a really sad way to live life. And of course, you wouldn't want that for your brother, your son, your family at all, your close friends. If they really were working hard to change, to better other people's lives, of course you'd want people to give them another opportunity as well. And of course this isn't to say he's there now, or will be in the near future, or maybe ever. But it is to say that often we judge people with a beginning and an end of what they've done before and not what they could do in the future, who they were before, and not who they are now or maybe later. It's really hard for me after watching this video to not take a step back and say that for all his faults, he is still someone's son, friend, and now father. That while he has made mistakes, who of us hasn't, and maybe not as much as him, but that just means he's gonna have to work much harder to right those wrongs. Hopefully this means he's going to stay clear of the industry that's helped shape a man capable of such actions. I do sincerely recommend watching the Real Ones episode, which I used throughout this video for context, and the link will be in the video description. So there is no great mystery in how Hollywood chews up kids and spits out adults with a long history of controversy, and of course Shia LaBeouf is no different in this regard. While there is no excuse for his actions, there are reasons that should trigger an empathetic response for a damaged person who has likely suffered, and then use that to cause suffering upon others. Shai says it's unlikely he'll ever return to Hollywood, and that he doesn't even consider his craft anymore, that his calling in life is now to help those around him, and to build himself up in the eyes of his daughter, so when she's old enough to google his name and read online about how much of a monster he is, that she can see he's become a good man since then. Hopefully, that becomes a reality.